Raphael and Lucifer, a mini epic of creation and evolution, Invocation and Part 1. Not Eden's fall, but new apostasy. A loss of truth with freedom is my theme. Celestial muse, enable words towards the task and tell what has been and which yet must be that shapes the spirit, mind and fate of souls whose thought remains a prisoner to this intermediate earth. Few venture through imagination's door to deep within or high above, or anywhere outside the narrow theatre of a world whose audience is larger than it knows, and on whose stage a host of forces play. So may you, inspiration, now draw near to assist, reveal, declare, because, more felt than seen by me or anyone, the forces told of are too bright and dark, too fair and foul to be directly held in view, or even described in common ways. It's thus, by symbol and through fantasy, you will convey the truths unrealized, while I, by means of simple words, protest freedom and forms of knowledge too ignored. By this, I show how ancient evil and the old revolt towards heaven could thrive and still find refuge in a world which, little thinking, had assumed its destiny could only be to reach enlightenment and end in every way improved above all superstition or oppression. It thought, while from afar a controlling lord observed time's passages, the fashions and inventions of the human mind observed and seized an opportunity. From Lucifer, that light which covers darkness as a lie, dimmed in preparation for the work and declaration of a great deceit by Satan called Beelzebub. From his preferred abode, the Prince of Air, enveloped in long shadows, fog and night, descended to his natural darkness in the halls of hell, descended on it, bat-like, wings spread wide above that gate from out of which his lower minions may not pass unless to post on missions of his rule. Some silence fell on noisy hell, some fear was felt, some few it may be even hoped for more activity or mild release, yet ceasing with the petty quarrels and the strife of would-be kingdoms claimed by prisoned spirits of the abyss, from each and all half-trembling homage soon was paid, eyes turned and fixed upon their leader, herald of the expected latest word of heaven and earth, and thus command of newest missions Hades spirits must attempt without reward save vengeance born of unremitting hate for God and man. They set to listen, and despite resentment showed amid surprise some admiration in form, the fiend was now more like a burning serpent winged and crowned, who reared above the spirit millions of deep earth. Servants, soldiers of our war of worlds, so far and long, Beelzebub began, you fed yourselves upon the smoky offerings of the ignorant, who at every stream and even corner of their ugly streets saw you as spirit saints or demigods, keen to appease you or to seek favours among the ills you sent to burden them. Of this, in future times, there must and will be less. For now, you all, and even I, must be less seen, if need be disappear. Concealed, we shall exert more power. Know this. The enemy divides up time in two whole eras of belief and mind. But now, the current age of faith is set to wane. It has perhaps two centuries to go before the age of higher knowledge dawns, but this gives opportunity to our side. Indeed, I know I have the way, the lie, the person who can lead whole multitudes away and very far from our great enemy. They'll no more fear or worship him than they will look to us beyond the veil. Through science, itself like a new faith to teach and alter attitudes and laws, 
you'll witness peoples grow indifferent, dismiss, hold almost in contempt the thought of larger being, divine life and design. From childhood to old age, they'll pass their days strong doubters, cynics mocking everything. Others, by temperament religious still, will flounder, grasping as the drowning do at straws, and seek for gurus, cults and myths, both ancient and more new, in course of which, and, as is right, talk of salvation will decline. It should become faith's chief redundancy, even we hope to many a laughing stock, scarce to be mentioned as belief is chased from public spaces into privacy by restless advocates of human rights, concerned lest word of the creator foe taint thought among the young, or those of any faith tradition or none. They will oppose all talk not proven fact, demand for reason highest place, seek laws to silence or to limit lies proceeding from religion and any particular claim that might disturb ideals of secular harmony. This way the sceptics serve our aims, chew at the bait and swell our captive throng below. As in their usual way, half fearful of their only lord, the Satan's minions for the first time seemed enthused. They laughed, smiled, even gave applause, until their lord, with glowing confidence, enlarged his theme. So now the tree of life is mine to offer and expound. I have the man, with him new times and vision can begin, for even at his birth my name, High Lucifer, arose above the horizon line as though in dedication to myself. Still more and better, I am aware that at the sun pretender's birth, he whom the great destroyer sent to earth, my champion's name itself stood there in contention with the so-called maker's place, while my own name conjoins with science, which is right. I hide there and am strong, and there I struggle with the enemy. Our fortunes rise, and almost best, my chosen one is what most minds deem good. He's kindly, just, and wouldn't tell a lie. He says and quite believes truth is his aim, as will assume the silly crowd for which sincerity is half or more of what they think religion is. But then in youth, my advocate was in his way quite pious too, would say his prayers, loved Milton's verse of Eden and of heavenly scenes, creation's work. His pockets bore its nonsense everywhere, even to Africa, to which he gave his pence for missions the easier to be ruled and crushed by us. He'll suffer patiently, this fool, a martyr to his many ills, part nervous and self-caused, though some will be. But see beyond the toil and honesty, and you will find him one of mine, of ours. He has the courage and the fortitude of those brave souls who work and lust for fame, that love their own opinions and before all else themselves and their own way. He'll work our heavy task, because not only will he search out many facts, but voice the stirrings of a mood for change, and even seem, as water bearers often do, to prophesy or incarnate the future in the now. It's soon and fast I'll send you out to aid this mental social shift, enlarge connection, open every door, for now's the time the scientific invalid must write and illustrate his evolutionary tree, set out the case, while he and everyone who'll read him still won't be aware that cells aren't simple and can't thus multiply to have effect as he would think. This way his ignorance and that of mankind in the mass lets loose illusions of all kinds, lends scope to every proof of cranks, like those same splitting monorail you'll find promoted by chief followers of my champion, Fanatic Huxley, and that wilder Heichel man, their falsehood needing decades to undo. Mad Huxley on the horse especially. So unaware of variety in creature types, that mouth will teach and be believed that horses must have grown from small to large across millennia though fossils show them joined and unevolved together. Mere similarity of types can be enough for some to find a vital link, but no matter what the discovery is, and though it owes but half or less to fact, 
enough the main idea takes root. Given human nature as it is, the prize is won. Increasingly, just theory by itself alone will serve for data and dogma that the ignorant masses will accept, because it's what the scientists say, even when most theory-based and speculation bound. Derived from their authority, to be believed things only need to sound like truth, helped as this is, because, like sound waves and the electrical, life's simpler mysteries and things invisible are what mankind will always have to trust is true. My agent births the times of godless thought in which the term creator loses weight, though, as shall be apparent in due time, his work in fact completes what yet another once all pious fool began. Newton, head off and round a Bible and the prophecies, in physics was obsessed with laws of motion and of gravity, and he, through number, measurement and sight, established those first principles deemed universal laws, through which quite soon all seemed as though mechanical. With that, our ancient foe became less relevant to the common life, by souls less awed, seen only as first mover of the world, and very much from outside too. No scope was left for variation, higher law or miracle, nor was there any full inside of things. So, let only my agent question how it was that being and life began, and you will see the enemy dismissed, even blown out quickly like a candle's flame, a power no longer seen or heard, scarce needed by the impersonal whole. Even so, some felt surprise when near his end, that most sublime of all materialists, Newton, that genius of maths, refused the bread and wine because he could no longer hold the enemy triune. Such was his logic at the last, and our hell's child was nothing if not masochist. He had no inner plane or level to explore, unless by that same alchemy he pursued in work he wisely kept from public view. Its greatest secret is that I'm Mercurius, there to be found indeed in conflict with the Hidden One, who's also there, less touch, less reach for reasons few would grant or know, but that serve well our purposes while trafficking in human souls. That rage for observation and the surface fact works quite successfully as a trap, much like the way the primitive mind and superstitious persons of all kinds prefer idol and image to the word. The generations yet to rise will think they can be free of God and gods won't be at all. For what invisibly I am receives their praise as that same matter we control. There's precedent for such. Rome's atheist materialist, Lucretius, paid homage to Venus in his way. But now, with my new champion, Humanity will start within the spreading luminous dark to take its halting first few steps to adoration of the one I am, Lord through things material, of death itself. Hearing that declaration, dark angels nearest to hell's Lord fell at his feet, and with single voice they cried aloud, All hail! Hail to the Satan from whose dread throne rise the force and mysteries of pain and plague. Hail to the highest Lord who swallows light and is empowered through force of gravity to blot out even stars in blackest holes, and through whose wisdom universal law itself is turned to serve the cosmic war. Praise half dismissed, the serpent soon resumed, for what's the secret of the knowledge tree, the path they'll find their evolution takes, how it selects who'll be and what will grow? Of course, it chiefly works, it only could, as hunters hunt and predators kill, in short, through death, whose many triumphs are proclaimed, at least implicitly. Each time it said, the universe and everything arose from out of chaos, till by chance some sentient earthly beings gained a giddy hold on wisdom in the way that once upon a rational time, as finally each child at school will learn, there were sea reptiles sprouted wings. And so we prove there is no lord of life, nor death that's evil, an effect of sin, in man, or of any larger cosmic fall. 
Followers of the enemy in ignorance will strive to encompass all they hear. They'll compromise and, as best they can, say almost anything to bridge the gap, invent whole variations on the theme they'll call theistic evolution. Some even with conviction, it may be, but most from only pride mixed with concerns they can't agree with the majority, or fear to lose a grasp on all belief and or authority to tell their flock just what it is their scriptures mean. In time, their thoughts less clear, its influence fades. Confusion strikes even when my agent dies, his death symbolic for the rest of time. Despite his claims, all pure denial of what, within their terms, creation and salvation mean, you'll find that church and state ally to bury the apostate soul with honours in an abbey's walls as though a defender of the faith. But note, like all believers left confused, the sad and sorry pious wife will not attend, is nowhere seen. She's like that half of Christendom that ever after's not quite sure what to believe or do, would like to know but never fully does, and wrings the hands, decides there is no fact or logic, only mystery to faith. And as to absent facts, we guard them well. He paused, felt almost he was stopped, although beside him there was none to see.